morning and welcome to the first meeting in 2018 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I'd like to remind members of the public to turn off mobile phones and any members of the committee using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they're switched to silent. The first item of the agenda is a declaration of interest. Claire Baker was appointed to the committee on Wednesday in place of Lewis Macdonald, and I'd like to warmly welcome Claire to the committee. Uh, I'm sure the committee will also uh, like to join me in uh, thanking Lewis Macdonald for his contribution uh, to the committee since the start of the parliamentary session when he has been deputy convener. Um, I'd like to invite Claire Baker to declare any interest relevant to the remit of this committee. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, I don't have any relevant interest to declare to the committee. Uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, the Parliament has agreed that only members of the Scottish Labour Party are eligible for nomination as deputy convener. And as Claire Baker is the party's nominee to the committee, do we agree that she will be deputy convener? Agreed. Agreed. Good. Um, our third item of business today is a decision on taking agenda item six in private. Are members agreed? agreed. Our next item of business today is a panel discussion on the Erasmus programme. Uh, this part of the meeting will be broadcast on Facebook Live and I'd like to welcome anyone observing today's meeting from Facebook to the public gallery. Um, I would also like to welcome the witnesses today, Jackie Colleen, Director of the British Council in Scotland, Emily Beaver, the Senior Development Officer with Youth Link Scotland, uh, Luke Humberstone, President of NUS Scotland, Marion Sporing, Senior Lecturer at the University <coughs> of Dundee, and Daniel Evans, who is the Centre Head, Commercial and Marketing of West Lothian College. Thank you all for attending uh, this morning. Um, many members of the committee um, will already be uh, familiar with the Erasmus uh, programme in different ways. And indeed, I believe uh, several members of the committee uh, have already participated in Erasmus programmes. And we were very pleased that um, the Jack Kane Centre um, hosted our business development day um, uh, last year um, uh, and told us a lot about the Erasmus programme. Uh, so there's a great deal of um, positive feeling uh, towards Erasmus uh, and that's one of the reasons why we were keen to find out more and to give um, uh, different participants the opportunity to let the wider public in Scotland know more about Erasmus and tackle some of the questions about what the future of Erasmus is um, in the context of Brexit. So I'm aware that you all represent um, very different approaches to Erasmus and uh, I think perhaps it would be helpful um, to start off with talking about um, what your particular organisations do in relation to the Erasmus programme. Uh, who would like to start? Uh, Jackie, would you like to start? Um, yes, I'm, I'm happy to. Thank you very much, convener, and thank you for the opportunity to come and share what we think is an incredibly important story about Erasmus Plus and its contribution in Scotland. Uh, the British Council is the UK's organisation for international cultural relations and education opportunities, and along with ICORUS, we are the national agency for running the Erasmus Plus programme in the, in the UK, and have done that since 2014. Thank you very much. Emily? Hi, hi, thanks for having me here today. I'm representing YouthLink Scotland. We're the National Agency for Youth Work in Scotland. Uh, we're a membership organisation, and so have members uh, from organisations that you'll recognise, like Scouts and Girl Guiding, Duke of Edinburgh, as well as smaller, uh, more local-level youth work organisations. Uh, and we're obviously representing and talking today about the youth element of Erasmus+. Plus. Thank you. Look. Um, <clears throat> hi, uh, um, I'm uh, Luke Humberstone, the President of the National Union of Students. So um, we represent all of the students across uh, Scotland. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to tell you a little bit about some of the experiences that uh, students have had um, on Erasmus. Yep, my name is Marlon Spurring. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm the chair of, the, of UCMLS, the University Council for Modern Languages in Scotland. And we represent modern languages departments and sections in universities in Scotland. And we work, of course, in all our institutions, but also in collaboration with teacher training with schools, with SILT, uh, Scotland's National Language Centre, to promote Erasmus and through that, of course, language learning and intercultural experience. So I can talk about that. Thank you. 
Uh, Daniel. Uh, good morning. My name is Daniel Evans from West Lothian College. Um, I'm responsible for the international program at the college, and I'm here today just to tell you about um, the experience that we as a college have had uh, with Erasmus Plus and how we've used it as a valuable tool to raise retention and attainment rates amongst our learners, as well as provide more opportunities to the more opportunities to those with fewer opportunities. Thank you very much. I'll pass on to Claire Baker now. Oh, um, thank you, Convener. Um, I was interested in the figures over the past year where we've seen the funding coming to Scotland increase from 16 million to 21 million. If the uh, witnesses had any views on what has led to that success, what factors might be involved in that. And following on from that, if you've seen so far any impact on the decision to leave the EU, if that's having any impact on either institutions bringing forward applications or students deciding to apply for the programme. That's just to all witnesses. Well, I can talk a little bit about the figures, if that's if that's OK. So we were very much delighted to see uh, that it uptake um, growing uh, over the past year. It is the 30th anniversary of the Erasmus programme, and so there has been um, a bigger profile for the program overall, and an increased budget um, in this in this in this year. So w we think that that has. Um, probably increased the profile of it um, and has enabled us to get that message out more broadly. Uh, we also do think that there is a, a, a continuing and growing appetite for international exchange in all its forms uh, throughout the whole of the country. I could probably add something to that as well. Um, I know that we're in, we're in the middle of a two-year um, application at the moment so our application is due to finish in 2019 so normally we wouldn't apply again this year however we're going to in January apply for another two-year one because this is the last year that the British government will um, actually guarantee the funding for Erasmus plus and what we'll do is we'll backload all the mobilities into 1920 so we're able to continue until 2020 but it's actually a lot of extra work that we hadn't really planned for because we're in the middle of organizing mobilities so it's a bit of a strain on us to do that and also our partners are very anxious about um, the future, our future involvement in the programme and our partnerships with them because they're similar institutions to us. We organise all our own mobilities and we reciprocate. So they're very worried about moving, losing a key partner um, in the UK. Um, yeah, I, th I, th I think that's, that's our two main concerns at the moment. So just briefly, two other questions. Um, the papers we received gives a breakdown for the 21 million in terms of where the money went, universities, schools, etc. Uh, the increase, was there a particular sector that benefited from that increase or was it fairly even across the board? And I think other colleagues will pick up on some of the broader issues, but the West Lothian, the way in which they run the project, is that, um, is that unique to the way in which it's run in Scotland? It seemed that they had a different model in terms of the time spent abroad, the focus on uh, encouraging a more, you could argue, a more inclusive approach to the programme. Is, is that unique to West Lothian within Scotland, or is there other institutions taking forward a, a similar model? Have we seen more diversity in the way in which the programme is delivered? I'm sure others will want to uh, com come in on this, but it's it's a very diverse programme. So it has it has uh, three key actions, as you as you know. So it enables different kinds of mobility, exchange, and cooperation. But within each of those three key actions, there are a variety of approaches. And so organisations that range from um, voluntary organisations, youth work organisations, through to uh, youth groups, colleges, schools, and universities can all apply. And we see a, a great um, range of approaches in how that happens. Some institutions establish and maintain long-term links with um, partners uh, over a number of years. Others will uh, g grow new ones at different at, at different times. So um, I think West Lothians is a particularly good example of how they've approached it, and their um, the, the outcomes that they've achieved for their students are fantastic as a result of that but we do see other um, similar if not identical approaches across the across the country add something to this as well I think uh, 
it's, it has been especially important for teacher development, especially to support the one plus two language policy in schools, because uh, Erasmus Plus programs, of course, support the training of teacher, teachers, not only through the first degree or initial teacher training, but also in the professional development of language teachers. And there has been a growth in programs uh, to some extent to support and facilitate the one plus two policy. And that is really also an area of concern in general that we as, as linguists have, that um, Erasmus Plus is essential, not only just for universities, but for the, for the whole sector, because we need uh, graduates, but we also need uh, people in vocational training, we need better trained teachers. So it's really an interlinked issue in community education. And that was the point I really tried to address in my paper, that we need uh, Erasmus Plus is essential and that it needs to tie in with all educational sectors. So if we lost this, this would be a major disaster, I would think. I think adding on to, to Marion's point, from our perspective, um, we agree, and, and uh, Erasmus Plus is a really great way for youth work practitioners themselves to embark on training and professional development opportunities. And we've certainly heard uh, anecdotally through our members that people are now using those opportunities and really going for them when perhaps they would have been potentially a little bit complacent about applying or thinking they'd maybe apply the next round, but because of Brexit looming and the uncertainty that they really are going for those opportunities. Uh, and YouthLink itself as an organisation has been running uh, a project over the last um, few months around uh, unlocking the potential for Erasmus, so providing applicant support for youth work organisations, many of which are applying are very small, don't often have the administrative capacity or potentially the know-how of or experience of, of doing these type of applications before. So we were really in that support um, mode, helping them to apply uh, and have seen a, a really positive increase in, in those interested in applying for the fund. Okay, that's great, thank you. And um, we have a supplementary from Richard Lockhead. It was in a, se it's in a separate theme, if I don't know if we'll come back on later. Right, okay, we'll bring in, you, do you have a, supp a supplementary actually, actually, right. actually to Emily? Um, Emily, it's r really great to, to have you represented here today from YouthLink, particularly in the year of um, young people. And um, I'm really interested to hear how Erasmus has actually helped um, you to train people in order to deliver educational and sporting opportunities. I wonder if you'd be able to talk us through some examples that Erasmus has um, given to people in order to um, allow young people to actually access, um, for example, more sporting and educational opportunities. Yeah, so uh, obviously, as the committee knows and was already mentioned about the visit to the Jack Kane Community Centre, so that's a really good example from our perspective of working with young people with fewer opportunities to really uh, broaden their horizons. And we think that that's really quite holistically moves into that education field and attainment uh, and talking about wider achievement. Um, I think, as Jackie had mentioned, the program's so diverse that actually near enough any project that's happening that has Erasmus funding does contribute to those aims that you were talking about. Um, for example, we know that a lot of the, the large football clubs have uh, taken Erasmus money. Now, that's not necessarily youth work that they're doing, but working with younger players um, to uh, improve employability, skills, language learning, um, uh, understanding of diversity, for example. Um, there's some really excellent projects uh, that Fife Council have run around um, young offenders' employability and improving that by, again, working with those practitioners to inform that. So there's really projects all over Scotland from a range of different sources that are working towards those goals. Um, and I think it's really great that you mentioned Year of Young People because it really contributes to that core aim of, of YOYP, of, of helping young people to shine globally uh, and to um, have, have a say uh, in in matters that affect them and we know that's obviously a, a fundamental right for young people and I think furthermore that Erasmus Plus really contributes to achieving a lot of the frameworks that we have here in Scotland whether that's developing a young workforce or it's curriculum for excellence it really touches on all of these areas and, and helps to achieve those. Um, Tavi Scott, did you have a supplementary? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, just on the, I think it's 2.3 million euros spent uh, on the Erasmus pro programme in schools in the last financial year. I mean, I know, but could you just say what the benefits are to for youngsters from, from Scottish schools going over, overseas, particularly, through the programme? So, um, the funding that goes into schools uh, goes in, in a number of ways. So, uh, for example, teacher development and training, as Marion mentioned, uh, a lot of 
uh, language teachers will improve their pedagogy and uh, develop their uh, professional development and their networks um, uh, across Europe and indeed beyond through Erasmus Plus. It's a main source of funding for that. It's possibly one that's less understood when people think about the Erasmus program. Uh, teacher development and teacher training is not the first thing that comes to mind. So one of the things that we're keen to ensure is that people do understand it has that benefit as well as mobility opportunities for young people. Many schools themselves are involved in exchange programs or in cooperation programs uh, fr from projects where they're looking at, for example, climate change or um, innovation or STEM and they will the Erasmus Plus enables them to have partnership and cooperation and some mobility with uh, partner schools across across Europe in the main so it does work at every level at the pupil level at the teacher level and at the whole school level as well uh, secondary schools from Scotland do have been overseas with pupils in the last year uh, we have the figures from 14 to 16 we from 2014 to 16 so we know that um, uh, 11,168 pupil students and young people in that period went. We don't have the 27 figure, the 2017 figures yet. Uh, how many schools would that involve? Do, do, do we have a breakdown on that? Uh, we have, um, I think it, I would have to double check that for you. Uh, I think we have um, around 550 schools is the yeah, figure that I've got here. Just, uh, just to get a, a sense yeah. of scale of how many schools are, are using Erasmus to, to uh, overseas. Yeah. I think it's also worth noting that um, not only is going overseas really beneficial as part of the programme, but also bringing international young people here to Scotland. Um, we know, again, for, for a lot of our youth work organisations, they do a lot of exchanges that way, so young people from across Europe come. Um, for example, Royston Youth Action in Glasgow uh, did a scheme, uh, I think, last summer, um, where they brought young people here and actually the language learning and understanding of others' cultures uh, was just the same uh, impact as, as if those young people had gone abroad. So I think that's worth mentioning as well that that's, that's a really valuable part of the programme sure. too. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, before we move on, Oh, I, I, I just want to make uh, Marian, please come in. Yes. yes. Just, uh, just wanted to say there are also lots of projects that maybe are not so clearly visible. So, for example, universities <coughs> and schools working together as sectors. So we have a project together with uh, CILD, um, the National Language Centre, that uh, university students who are going on Erasmus exchanges are actually working with schools in Scotland, and they meet before they go on exchange. While they're on exchange, they're, they're writing blogs, they're exchanging over, via Skype, and they're visiting schools afterwards. So, so there are many, many uh, ways how this impacts without actually being even clearly visible in the funding application. So we're really trying to, to make the most, of, of the most benefits of all these different opportunities. Thank you. Yes, I was very struck by West Lothian College's paper where you see that every single FEA learner in West Lothian College now has a, an opportunity to apply uh, for Erasmus, and that would include people studying motor vehicle maintenance and hairdressing and childcare and things that perhaps the general public wouldn't normally associate with Erasmus, but it must make a big difference in those areas of, uh, of education as well. Absolutely. Um, I mean, we started in 2015 just with a, a number of sectors and I was getting requests from centre heads in other areas when are our students going to get a chance. So we made sure for the 2017 application we, we worked really hard to source partners across Europe that did vocational training specifically and had a good reputation as we do um, for finding good work placements and good outcomes for their learners in that particular sector. So we were able to source eight partners covering 10 different sectors, plus a few side sectors. For example, our business students go to um, Crangevier or Twin Town in France, but we can send our travel and, travel and tourism students on that one too, because the kind of placements that that school organises over there are the same. Our sports and fitness students and our um, childcare students go to the same organisation in Italy, and our construction students go to a, really, a college we've built a really strong relationship over the last few years in Spain and we've worked all over Europe to find the best placements. The motor vehicle students go to Sweden, the town of Kalmar and we receive their students as well and um, there's great relationships built, built between the teaching staff, between the students, we organise cultural events. It's, it's a whole culture and ethos and 
it brings a different dimension to our college. It feels really vibrant when you're in there. It's got a European feel to it. There's always things going up. We've got flagpoles up. We fly the flags of the countries that are in the college that week, and uh, they change every week, and we've got flags from all over the world now, and our students are getting a completely different experience to the one that they encountered at school. A lot of our learners didn't have a great school experience, and they're coming into college, and they're just experiencing that their horizons are lifting. They're looking beyond Friday and they're looking at what they're going to do next year or in their future lives. And when they come back from mobility, we just we just encounter different different young people. And it's it's just amazing. It's what keeps me going because although I'm head of commercial, there's no money in this because the funding is tight. But the difference it makes to the young people's lives is just amazing. Okay. And Mary Gujon. Uh, thank you, convener. I, I just really want to pick up on a couple of points that, uh, on the back of what Rachel Hamilton and Tavish Scott had, had asked. Um, Jackie, you'd initially talked about the diversity, and I was glad to hear Emily mention about the, the football clubs and some of the, the sheer range of projects that Erasmus covers, because I do think that you know people t generally tend to think of universities and that being the, uh, the maybe the we hear about Erasmus, um, because I know that East of Scotland European Consortium have done a lot of work trying to actually build that picture of all the ways in which uh, and all the different uh, bodies that take part in the Erasmus programme, um, and particularly uh, our local authorities as well, and through nurseries. I mean, you talked about the, the, teacher, the teacher training too. Um, but one thing I, I would like to ask is, uh, Emily, I know you've been part of coordinating the Keep Erasmus Plus campaign, and it's just in terms of, right, well, where do we go from here? And has there been any, just really how that campaign has been going, um, has there been any sort of engagement with any bodies that you're aware of, or are you part of any engagement directly with the UK government at the moment as to what will happen in the future? And do you have any sort of sense of where they're looking to go? Yeah, so the, thank you for mentioning the campaign, that's really good. <laughs> um, so for, for those who maybe aren't familiar, YouthLink Scotland are leading a UK-wide campaign uh, called Keep Erasmus Plus, uh, and that's a partnership across the Erasmus Plus um, programme, so with uh, lots of other sectors, uh, and partners include NUS, SCVO, the National Youth Agency, UK Youth, British Youth Council, Scottish Youth Parliament, Young Scott, Leonard Cheshire Scotland, uh, YMCA Scotland, Carers Trust Scotland, uh, and we have lots more people who are talking to us about becoming partners and and for me again like you said that's really opened our eyes uh, we're obviously as an organization focused on the youth work sector but looking at the difference um, that all of these organizations have said so for example uh, I've been really um, moved by the health and social care impact um, of Erasmus plus through for example the European voluntary service volunteers that are working in Leonard Cheshire disability and really helping um, disabled people in Scotland to live a really fulsome life uh, and, and hopefully become a, a career for them to, to work in that style of work. Um, we don't have direct contact with the UK government at this point in the campaign. Uh, we're hoping to move in that direction. Um, like I said, with, with all of the partners that we've got, uh, the lobbying efforts and, and talking to different um, elected members uh, is really wide ranging. Um, so we know that, for example, the British Youth Council have really been uh, talking to politicians down in London um, that they're already in touch with. So we're moving in that direction. Um, it's obviously a lot of work for everybody uh, on top of what we're already doing, but um, I think we're really fueled by the stories of people who've benefited from the funding, uh, and that, that's really driving us to continue. I don't suppose if anybody would be able to help with this this next point. Obviously, I, I mean there are different examples. You see third member third countries that can be uh, part of the Erasmus Plus program. Um, but in terms of, I mean, we've uh, heard a bit about the the model that they have in Switzerland. So it is like a, a parallel program that they have. I don't know if anybody has any details on how that program actually works, uh, and just some of the finer points of that. And for other partner countries that are part of Erasmus Plus, how does all of that operate? I think being part of the Erasmus Plus programme would be the ideal uh, scenario that we would all be looking for, um, but what are some of the other options and some of the other programmes and, and how do they actually work? Happy to start on that if that's okay. I should say that um, for the British Council our position is that we believe that the UK should seek to remain within the Erasmus Plus 
programme. It's the biggest and most successful mobility and exchange programme in the world and its benefits are multiple at, at every level. Um, if we were to uh, not be part of it in the future, then we would need to uh, create something we believe that tried to recreate all of those all of those benefits of, of participation. Um, and we're very keen that everybody understands what those benefits of participation are for, for, for everyone. Uh, we, we do know that um, Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and EU candidate countries like um, Turkey, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, and Serbia do p participate fully um, in the as programme countries in the Erasmus programme. They have required to create their own um, bilateral arrangements then with the with Erasmus Plus, and then to make a financial contribution um, into into the programme. So it is possible for non-members to participate in the Erasmus Plus programme, but our starting position would be that it would be better to remain in it and negotiate from there if we can. The programme for t um, 2021 onwards is under be has begun to have development at the moment. The National Authority in the UK is the Department for Education, and in our um, national agency role uh, as you know, the, the administrator of Erasmus Plus, the British Council has fed into um, the development, the early stages of development around, you know, the kinds of themes that the next programme might want to take on board. Um, we'll continue to do that up to the point that we're able to um, as that programme's developed. I mean, I understand if you're not able to answer this, but I mean, do you know anything about the particulars of the, the programme that they have in Switzerland in particular? and how that operates? Um, we have a little bit more further information. Um, so uh, the SPICE briefing that you have already received did mention about the higher education element of the Switzerland's parallel program. They also uh, run other branches of the project as in the same kind of form. Um, so the youth aspect, for example, we actually reached out to Movisha, who are then the, the national agency in, in Switzerland. Um, and they said the challenges that they've experienced uh, include negotiating complex bilateral agreements in order to retain um, maintain the European programs and being excluded from the international network and further de development for the EU program for education. So they really expressed to us that this, for them, really is seen as an interim solution. It is not a long-term sustainable um, piece of work. Uh, it, it really is um, temporary. So there's more information in our written submission on that, if you would like more information. OK, thank you very much. I think it was quite important. There's extensive uh, information in the written submission that I think is important to tease out. And uh, what struck me is that there are, there are programme countries and there are partner countries and... Um, I mean, you might want to explain a little bit more about that. But my understanding from the written submission is that the programme countries were members of the EU, members of the EEA, and countries that were moving towards membership, but everyone else was a partner. Yes, and I suppose the difference is the ability to shape and influence the, 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 the programme, the priorities, the eligibility, what it will look like, as opposed to being on the fringes and... Um, uh, part participating from the from from the outside in would be the headline way of uh, dis dis describing that, and that is the um, main consideration for us for the thinking about that for the future. If the UK becomes a partner com company country, I think organisations like West Lothian College would be excluded from participation because we would no longer be able to do bilateral exchanges with the partnerships, with the partners and partners that we've built up relations with. We'd be excluded from that aspect of the programme. <coughs> Um, Jackson Carlo. I understand the queue convener is not a follow up, but so it's, right. it's a separate point. So okay. I don't know if you have somebody ahead of me. Right. I don't think there are any supplementaries, oh. actually. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, can, uh, I'm slightly interested in the administration of the programme by uh, the British Council. Obviously, the British Council is the UK vehicle um, for participation. Um, and in Scotland, we have a separate education system. And I'd be interested to know the administrative way in which the allocation of funds that Scotland secures is then distributed. Interestingly, when we were in Brussels last summer and met with European officials, um, there was a very, uh, I thought, open uh, view 
that insofar as there could be negotiating with the United Kingdom as uh, the member state, the potential for any differentiated settlement ultimately, um, that programmes like Horizon 2020 and Erasmus were potentially of that ilk. And so I'm interested to know, obviously, uh, the British Council's view and the Prime Minister, I know it has stated that she very much wishes to see the whole of the United Kingdom participate. But in the way that uh, Erasmus, is, uh, the British Council, um, is organised in Scotland and operates, and given that Scotland has a separate educational system, is it perfectly conceivable that in a scenario where a United Kingdom participation had not proved possible for Scotland, given that administrative infrastructure, to be uh, a partner in Erasmus in its own right? I think that would probably have to be a matter for, for, for government. The, um, the national authority for the whole of the UK is the UK government and the Department for Education within that. And we are the managing agency alongside I I chorus. Um, the, the Within that, we uh, obviously work across the policy differences and the um, reserved and devolved areas of competence across the whole of the whole of the UK. And I think Erasmus Plus has been successful uh, in working within the grain um, of the differences across the, the whole of the UK. Uh, the f any future arrangement um, would be a matter for, for governments uh, in terms of um, being a managing authority or a national authority for a future a future program. No, no, I appreciate. If I'm understanding you correctly. Yes, sorry, no, no, you, you are, and I appreciate that. But I think I'm also trying to establish in my own mind um, how practical you believe the infrastructure that you have in place in the way that the programmes are managed in Scotland would be in the event that Scotland was seeking to participate in its own right, were that ultimately the only option that was open to us. I think if Scotland were uh, able to in any way, um, either as part of the UK or um, in, a, in another form, able to participate in the programme, we would, we would work to ensure that we were able to, to service that and meet those needs. I, d I do think that those um, aspirations that colleagues have talked about at every, at every, every, every level are, are very strong here. Um, and I think there is a very strong appetite to, to continue um, and to make sure that the benefits at every level are not are not are not lost. Uh, if you are asking if the British Council would be uh, willing and able to su su support that, I would just have to say that we would obviously do that within the overall structure. I, I, and I, I'm not advocating that at this point because the Prime Minister has made very clear that she hopes to see the whole of the UK participate. But but it was an interesting um, dynamic of the uh, exchanges that the committee had when we were in Brussels, and I was just interested to participate, it, uh, to pursue it with uh, representatives here too, to have an underst a greater understanding. So thank you for that. Thank you. Ross Greer. Um, <clears throat> travel is obviously absolutely integral to the Erasmus Plus programme and as much as there are levels of involvement even for countries far out with Europe, the core of um, Erasmus activity is between countries that have existing freedom of movement arrangements as part of the EU and the, the wider economic area. On the UK's current trajectory, freedom of movement is a, a right that we're going to lose. If the UK was to still maintain some level of engagement with Erasmus+, Plus, but without freedom of movement rights for our citizens, what impact do you think that would have more broadly, and what impact would it have for your organisations? If I may uh, start. Um, obviously, um, being part of EU is not a prerequisite of being part of Erasmus+, Plus, but as we've seen from the example in, in Switzerland, um, when freedom of movement or immigration rules are, are, are changed, um, it does make it much more complex to develop those um, bilateral agreements with I individual countries. Um, so we would be concerned that there would be a lag um, in being able to negotiate that new um, arrangement so that students would lose an opportunity to be able to go and travel uh, to the, these other countries. I think it was really clear from the SPICE briefing and certainly the, the research that we've done that it's very difficult to get a full picture of what the, the agreement with Turkey looks like, for example, when we know that they would perhaps, it would look quite similar to that model. Um, though I did find the, the letters that were in the, the meeting papers very interesting to, to see a little bit of an insight into that relationship. Um, 
our guess would be that it would look more similar to their model. Um, so it would be it would be great if someone can get hold of um, what that what that agreement really looks like in detail. For universities as well, of course, it would be a major concern for us because we're relying very heavily, not only in language departments but in general, on, on uh, exchanges and Erasmus Plus through Erasmus Plus, and also on staff, um, and uh, also in the wider teaching sector. So, uh, and as I mentioned in the briefing paper, the universities in the UK but also in, in Scotland uh, have signed up to actually to double exchanges. And if we don't have that, because most of our students actually go through Erasmus Plus, so. Uh, it would be a disaster for, for uh, both for, for the academic, the social and internationalization of the content, but also for the experience of our students and of our staff and for research. I, I, I suppose my, my own personal view is that um, just the way that the final decisions that are taken and the way that the UK deals with freedom of movement will have direct impact on our ability to stay in the Erasmus Plus program as a program country um, based purely on the Swiss experience and what happened to them when they tried to restrict it. For your college as, as it stands at the moment, I assume the major overwhelming majority of your engagement with the programme will be with countries for which we have freedom of movement arrangements through EU membership? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Adding that um, through the uh, international credit mobility dimension of the Erasmus Plus program, uh, institutions such as the universities of Edinburgh and Glasgow have um, significantly extended beyond Europe, for example, into, into into South America. So it is possible in the current within that framework within the current program to to go further afield, um, Australia as well. Thank you. Um, the Swiss experience has been mentioned a few times. People might not necessarily be uh, aware of the kind of history and background to that. Um, I wonder if, if someone, perhaps Jackie, could explain uh, basically what happened in terms of Switzerland and Erasmus uh, when they withdrew from freedom of movement. So my understanding, and I thought your spy, spice briefing actually was quite helpful. <laughs> um, I hope that perhaps we could get it on the record. So uh, within within um, within Switzerland, um, there was a decision to restrict uh, freedom 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 of movement, which raised questions around how it would continue to participate in uh, Erasmus Erasmus Plus, which um, is contingent on accepting the EU's freedom of movement rules. Uh, so the um, the twenty eight um, EU member states and the other EEA countries all accept f uh, freedom of movement as members of the of the single market. Um, so when the when Switzerland, as I understand it, dis introduced uh, those restrictions, it then had to uh, negotiate a separate or try to negotiate what they have described as a I think an interim is that the word they have used an interim. Uh, bilateral arrangement to allow them to participate in the scheme, which added um, cost and complexity to the programme overall and made it far more cumbersome for uh, Swiss participants in the in the programme. That's um, that's probably uh, a headline summary. I don't have a very great deal of detail on the the um, how that filtered down to institutional level or to to. Uh, schools or participating organisations, my, my understanding is that it will have acted as a disincentive for application because it made things more cumbersome and uh, increased the timescales for everybody who wanted to apply, as well as the actual um, the uh, the actual stages that people had to go through. Um, I think that Youth Route Link Scotland in their submission specifically ruled out the Swiss model, saying that it just wasn't appropriate. Yeah. Like we said, we reached out to the Swiss national agency Movisha and they expressed to us clearly that they found this to be an interim program, um, not one that they, they wish to remain part of longer term. They did wish to be a part of uh, the wider Erasmus Plus program and in fact I believe that's what uh, the Swiss government are, uh, are hoping to achieve in the next um, seven years of the Erasmus program. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, I uh, studied through an Erasmus Socrates 
um, programme uh, some years ago. So I, when I was reading through the papers, it certainly it kind of took me back to uh, some pleasant and happy uh, experiences that I had going through that particular uh, scheme. Now, just a few questions just regarding the uh, the papers that we have. Um, but some, first of all, just actually, I thought, Daniel Evans, I thought your comment this morning, uh, just that regarding uh, looking beyond Friday, was it's probably one of the most salient points that I've actually heard in, in many committees, uh, particularly regarding this Erasmus uh, Plus scheme. Uh, and it's certainly something that um, I'm keen for, for all members to really kind of take on that point, because I think it was extremely powerful. Uh, but certainly in terms of the, uh, some of the questions, uh, uh, certainly to Jackie, uh, in, uh, in your submission, um, you spoke about uh, that 55 current world leaders um, have, um, have been educated in, in the UK and you feel as if that would be beneficial uh, going forward. Um, do you have any evidence that actually that has been beneficial? Um, I, so I suppose we're, we're, we're talking broadly about uh, the, the, the soft power and uh, cultural relations of the, the, the UK. So both the UK as a whole and Scotland in particular are renowned for the, the strength of their education systems and the fact that people have had a very positive experience when they come here creates an ongoing positive uh, association with Scotland and with the wider UK uh, throughout their careers and we would hope that um, if we are able to continue in programmes like Erasmus the um, the, inco the uh, intake of uh, foreign students and young people at different stages in their life would will continue. That um, mutuality of exchange is very important for our success as a country overall not just for our own young people to go out and uh, gain that international experience, but for us to be enriched by inward mobility and also for people to take away that positive and lifelong enduring association with the UK beyond beyond the time that they've that they've had here. It's one of the one of the ways that we we would think that um, we contribute to the sort of um, st stability and prosperity of the country more broadly. Um, mm. Um, so one question for everyone, um, there will be uh, people who are looking at their future, people who are in school looking at their future, and there will be some um, people who are considering going to university and they want to go and study languages uh, and have that opportunity to go and study elsewhere. So uh, if there is that uncertainty now in terms of what's going to happen, um, how do you think this will actually affect uh, people in Scotland, but also people elsewhere who are considering maybe wanted to come and study in Scotland for a period of time. How do you think that's actually going to affect uh, the numbers of people coming to, to have that, that cultural exchange and educational exchange in three years, four years, five years' time? If, if I may maybe <coughs> respond to that, because actually just yesterday we held an event at the University of Dundee as one of many events where we actually had school pupils uh, engaging with business leaders from all over Scotland uh, and uh, talking about the importance of language learning and intercultural exchanges and uh, going abroad and actually not only for people who go to university but also people who go to college, people who become hairdressers or engineers and IT, uh, IT and are talking about the skills gap which is very wide and it's actually um, <clears throat> very important to bring our young people um, make them aware that it is highly important that we have got these opportunities. So there is great appetite of learning languages and that in the university sector, for example, we, we uh, see a situation that actually more people learn languages and with a degree, for example, engineers or lawyers or um, uh, psychologists, for example, or uh, tourism uh, specialists, because they see that this is essential in able to, to, so you don't need to move at all. You can actually stay in Scotland, but you need to be able as a shop assistant, as a tourist guide, um, as a driver to be able to engage. So. There is a great appetite and we have got evidence that people would like to take this and people like to go on Erasmus, but the questions we are being asked by pupils, by teachers, but also by potential applicants is for how long do we have this opportunity? They're extremely concerned and parents are concerned that this opportunity will be denied to them. 
So, uh, I mean, we, we were trying to reassure and say, well, actually, in our view, of course, even after Brexit, the need to, to engage and to go abroad and to learn languages is even more important. But we, of course, we cannot give people the certainty, but there is certainly an awareness there also by the public uh, to some extent that we cannot shut ourselves off, that we need to have the opportunities to do so. But I think what is missing at the moment maybe that maybe the impetus through the campaign actually to make people aware what, what it could mean if we have to withdraw from programs like this. If I can. Sure. Um, I think for, for young people, considering um, the opportunities that are available for them in terms of Erasmus Plus, it's not just university, it's college, it's apprentices, and it's also staff as well that have the, the, the opportunity at the moment. Um, and that uncertainty is obviously very worrying for people, and, and the, the prospect of that those opportunities not being available in the future is um, it would be a tragedy if it was lost. I think as well it's maybe worth, worth pointing out that a lot of the um, research that's been done with young people since Brexit about what their main concerns are and what they wish for their um, elected members to lobby on their behalf on, Erasmus Plus has come up really strongly consistently in different research uh, as one of the key areas, as well as um, social justice, um, really interestingly. So again, that really close tie between um, social mobility and physical mobility uh, around Europe as, as a really key issue for young people. Uh. I would just echo the points that fellow panellists have made about this being a really significant area of uh, c concern um, at the point that the UK is going to need to be even more international and have a, a strong base of internationalism at the, you know, with, with, within our young people um, in terms of their employability but also in terms of our economic um, and social prosperity, the need to be able to participate and uh, exchange internationally has probably never been greater. Uh, we don't want young people to feel um, disincentivized from um, looking at careers or study choices or opportunities that have an international dimension because of uncertainty about the future, because we need them to have those opportunities and that outlook even more than ever. It certainly, I mean, that, that lack of clarity uh, going forward uh, will, uh, will certainly have that, uh, that uh, negative effect uh, for people to consider uh, that opportunity. I mean, I must admit, when I had the, the when, when it arose for me to uh, uh, sign up to a course to go and study abroad, I couldn't sign it quick enough um, to, to go and have that opportunity. Uh, so I generally know how beneficial uh, it, it is, that cultural exchange. Uh, and so just your, your final point there, Jackie, it touches upon something that Marion has put in, in her written submission. Uh, where, uh, Marion, uh, you state that uh, the still widely spread assumption that everybody speaks English is a fallacy. Yeah. Uh, would you like to expand would you like on me that? Would you expand on that? Yes, I, th I think it's a very widely held belief that everybody speaks English and you just need to go abroad and it's okay if you speak English. So, um, A, I would like to point out as also as a non, as a, uh, English is my second language, <laughs> but um, that uh, it is not uh, the case and there is research um, by, by, by the Council of Europe, by European Language Centre, by the British Council, which actually exposes this, this misconception that although English is taught, as I would think, as the first uh, foreign language uh, in, in, in Europe as well, that this does not automatically mean that people have uh, attained the skills that they can use it freely, because you only build this up if you then back it up, for example, with exchanges. And uh, that this is a... Uh, an obstacle in the mindset, I think, in, in, in society, and that permeates, I think, many, many different areas of saying, well, uh, we don't need, need to do that. Because, uh, especially if you look at the employment market, and that's not only for graduates, but for, for any, uh, anything, uh, it is highly important that people have the flexibility, the flexibility of mind and the global mindset. And that is not just language skills or the ability to say a bit. And it doesn't also not mean that somebody needs to be absolutely fluent speaker, but actually in the understanding and the willingness to, to learn languages and picking them up at different stages of their life. And that's where maybe lifelong learning also comes into that. So it is highly essential that we develop this in, in people. Um, also, English as a, as, as a language in the internet, for example, is actually going down. It's one, 
one of the biggest ones, but I think Mandarin and Arabic are catching up very quickly in Spanish. So we cannot rely on the fact that everybody speaks English. And in any case, if you're talking about uh, this, it is always much better if you can talk to people in their own language. We cannot rely on that. And UK English is only one variety amongst many different world Englishes. And uh, there's international English as a specific variety. So we cannot just rely on this fact. And most people, as you will know, in, 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 a European, in the European Union will also have learned two languages. And certainly, if you go to university, it's expected that you have relatively fluent knowledge of two languages. So these are actually the graduates who are coming to us in many cases in the universities, and they already have two languages and English and learning more. So our young people also have to compete on the global market, but also within here. And again, yesterday at this uh, business event we run with SILT, which is one of many events across Scotland, it, uh, several employers, large employers spoke to us and they said they have difficulties in recruiting appropriate staff at all levels, not just graduates. And they have to look to the European Union at the moment to find people with the skills. And a lot of these are selling skills, marketing skills um, on, on the phone. They just cannot find enough people who have got the skills. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Rachel Hamilton. Well, I was actually going to ask the panel um, how you'd like to see the future shape of a framework um, and how you're actually feeding into the negotiations. All of you have talked about the importance of Erasmus and, and how much um, benefit we get from it here in Scotland uh, and the value that you find in it. And, and it's just a wide open question to see, um, you know, what we can do better, perhaps. Um, what don't you like about Erasmus and, and how are you going to feed into the, the shape of things to come? We've been very involved, uh, Youth Link Scotland were involved in different elements with, along with the national agency about shaping the current programme and that's certainly something that we would like to maintain going forward. So our position is that we, our preferred option is that we would, the UK would stay a programme country, so have that full access um, and <coughs> involvement in shaping the programme um, and the full range of opportunities that come along with that. Obviously we've already spoken about the campaign that we're leading on, um, that's, that's, we feel, our our way of contrib contributing to the negotiations as far as possible uh, and hoping to shape those. Um, the, the title of your campaign is um, exactly what we feel, <laughs> Keep Erasmus Plus. Um, you know, um, it's, it's it's so vital, it's so positive. Everyone who um, has, has been part of it uh, th thinks so. Um, in terms of any uh, problems, um, there's possibly one around the um, some of the some of the timings of the course in um, the apprentices side of things um, um, and perhaps that could be reflected on um, and if we if we are going to lose Erasmus plus then you know if we could replace it with something better um, in terms of the number of partner countries that will be involved or you know if we come up with our own program that would be great but we've got one already so let's keep it I, I, I just um, um add to that and I would just echo that it's really important that the UK stays in Erasmus Plus. If I was to change it though, um, our FE learners, which is probably about 65% of learners in the college, go on a two-week work experience um, overseas and they undertake a work experience unit while they're there and they work, live, experience what it's like to be in a foreign country. Our HE learners and about 30% of all H, all of our students are HE learners, under the current rules of the programme must go away for a minimum of three months. And for a college learner who lives at home, who might never have been overseas before, it is just too long. It is geared towards universities um, who send their learners for semesters or for whole years. We need that three months to come down so that college HE learners can get an equivalent overseas experience. Could, could I just ask a supplementary on, on the point that you made about the uh, timings, not just about the um, work experience, but um, my colleague uh, was explaining to me, because he has experience obviously of the Erasmus programme, about the difficulties of the um, three year, this very much talking about um, uh, higher education in terms of the length of a degree. Um, is there any difficulties that you have found uh, about the three-year degree and the four-year degree and the differences that that poses? And how can we improve that if there was a difficulty? Maybe just uh, specifically for, for, for spe specialist language students, this is an issue because the year abroad is compulsory. 
So that's a four-year degree they have to do, which is, is, is fully funded. And if you take, this is also a requirement for teacher training, for entrance into teacher training. So if this opportunity would be taken away, this would be very, very difficult for the students because they wouldn't be able to fulfill the requirement for entrance into teacher training. And also, this would have a major impact on their results. Uh, however, there are also a number of, of uh, students who are going abroad as part of a three-year and four-year degree because I mean, we, we have a situation that although the majority of students studies on a four-year degree, there are options to go on to a three-year <coughs> degree. However, the likelihood that people will go abroad then and can fit it into their study program is going to be very much reduced because they're worried about their results and also the, the requirements, degree requirements and professional requirements will be much more difficult to um, fulfill. Yeah. And it raises a lot more concern for students as well, of course. Okay, final point. Mm. Um, you mentioned about um, uh, the number of, um, you know, the skills gap that we've currently got. Do you think that um, uh, some tweaks in, in the Erasmus programme would um, increase employability? Well, it, obviously, employability opportunities are huge because it's, we, it's proved that in this SPICE document that um, it increases people's chances of getting a job. Um, however, how about looking at the retention that we have of the number of students that come um, from other countries um, and actually doing a job to actually keep them here to work and live in Scotland. I would think that would also be a beneficial uh, way to do so. I mean, from, from the university's perspective in general, I can, can say that actually a lot of students who have come to us uh, maybe initially for, for Erasmus semester or a year, then continue to study and maybe to do their postgraduate degree here or to do another degree or then work work here. Um, so I, th I think that would be certainly something which would be beneficial to look at ways how this could be done. Also, um, the opportunity to have teachers or people who, who could um, give their experience and their, share the experience here. That is actually something extremely valuable. And again, if I may say so, for the teacher training, that is highly essential. And again, if you want to successfully support one plus two, this is essential. If I may, um, we don't have uh, tracking data looking at the numbers of incoming Erasmus Plus students who subsequently stay, but we do have um, quite a lot of anecdotal examples of people who have come on Erasmus Plus programmes who have come back either to work or to uh, take on postgraduate study or um, develop, develop careers, and those links tend to be positive and, and enduring. The other thing I wanted to emphasise was We've done quite a lot of um, employer research and, uh, re and tracking of our own UK and Scotland participants in Erasmus+. Plus. And we know that they're not just more uh, employable, but also they're more likely to both retain employment and progress into management um, and be more, uh, I suppose, uh, have a, a uh, a stronger career progression um, than peers who haven't participated in Erasmus Plus programmes. The other th area of concern for us would be looking at the programme as a whole and thinking about uh, its reach into the whole of, our, of society and all our communities. So we do know that Erasmus Plus is very successful for communities that have experienced disadvantage. And we'd be very concerned that if this opportunity were not to be available uh, for disadvantaged communities, what would, what would replace that either in an interim period or, or beyond that? Um, it's possible that in other areas that gap might be met in other ways, but we would be particularly concerned around uh, young people in particular coming from disadvantaged communities should this opportunity not be available to them in the, in, in, in the future. Um, so, yeah, we, the last thing I would say is that we know it's not just languages. Languages are fundamentally important, and we do a lot of research into what the UK's language needs are going to be into, in, into the future, and uh, we are not doing as well as we, as, 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 as we could be. But we do also know that employers very highly value international experience, even if it's not from the point of view of being a linguist. So having, um, a, having had a, 
an international experience, be that on a work placement, a voluntary placement, or a study placement, uh, is uh, a differentiating factor when employers are looking for their future workforces. I know, sorry, just, just quickly anecdotally, we welcomed a group of um, Spanish trainee chefs to West Lothian College a couple of years ago. We put half of them into Glen Eagles and the other half into the Sheraton in Edinburgh for work experience placements after they'd spent a bit of time in our kitchens. And some of them continued to come back, and I believe one or two are still work. have come back to the country after their studies and work here all the time. But when our students went to the Spanish college for the experience the story just grew arms and legs and ended up on the Spanish national news with our lecturer and students and you just wouldn't get that kind of exposure without this Erasmus plus program and the students were just absolutely buzzing about it as was the lecturer when they came back and uh, we've got a really strong relationship with that overseas college now which will continue regardless of Erasmus plus but Erasmus plus was what made it possible. Thank you. Um, Richard Lockhead. <coughs> Thank you for giving evidence today, and uh, you mentioned chefs there, did you? Because mm -hmm. Scotland's short of chefs, so yes. it's good to hear you're yeah. making a contribution to get more chefs to, to work in this country. Um, Parliament had a debate on Brexit this week, and it was sponsored by this committee. The, the debate took place a couple of days ago, and one of the themes in the debate was the fact that the EU want a deal by November 2018, which is only a few months away. So... The UK government clearly have a lot of work to do, and I was just wondering what your thoughts were, if you felt or had a sense that the UK government were treating seriously the issues we've been discussing today around Erasmus. Do you want, who wants to go first? Are you getting feedback? Are you getting positive messages? The Erasmus program obviously is is just one of of many. Although obviously all of us sitting here know that it has a really wide reaching um, and strong impact within all areas of our communities in the UK. It's obviously just one element of the programs, and we hope that the UK government is really listening to people that are talking to them uh, about the impact and really showing um, where it is making a difference. And I hope opening their eyes to that so that it will be a prominent feature hopefully in this next stage of the negotiations um, where we'll really start to see some movement towards uh, maintaining um, program country status. I mean the British Council have a very close, close relationship with the UK government so what feedback are you getting from them in terms of how they're responding to your concerns? So I suppose it's in for us it's in, in, in two parts so one is uh, feeding into the specifically into the Department for Education as the national authority around uh, the shape of a future Erasmus Plus programme beyond um, 2020 when the current one uh, will, will, will conclude. We welcomed the Prime Minister's statement in December um, indicating uh, participation and being underwritten in, uh, up until 2020. We noted that programmes education and cultural programs were particularly highlighted in the Prime Minister's speech in that and we have uh, specifically um, in, at every opportunity made clear the importance of programmes like Erasmus Plus, Horizon 2020 and Creative Europe in, in that respect. Um, I'm making, in, making sure that the wider benefits, the, the, the depth of the programmes reach as well as the breadth of what it achieves for us are, are fully understood. But I, I don't have um, any deeper insight into where that sits. And it's ironic, of course, it's the Year of Young People and we're talking today about a threat to Erasmus, which is a big benefit of EU membership for young people. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on the fact that Scotland voted to remain in the referendum, unlike other parts of the UK, and more so young people voted to remain, and if you felt that Erasmus was an influencing factor in why so many young people voted to remain in the EU referendum. Uh, absolutely, and the work that we've done um, uh, or have done since <coughs> the Brexit vote uh, has really shown to us that Erasmus was one of the th key things on young people's minds, um, as was mentioned earlier, about looking forward to their futures and what opportunities they might or might not be able to access is certainly um, definitely up there in, in prominence of the issues that they care about. In the research that we've done with young people around um, both around the world, but particularly here, around their attitudes to internationalism. We know that there is a huge appetite for it. Young people want to be able to travel, to have these experiences, to uh, exchange and develop overseas. 
we think that's really important that we listen to that appetite from young people, particularly in, year of, in, in this, the year of young people, where we can uh, show how our young people can um, flourish internationally as well as, as well as at home. And we, we're very strongly encouraging people to um, consider Erasmus Plus seriously and apply to it in this, in this year uh, for, for all of these opportunities. We would encourage everyone to not just think it's under threat in the future. We would be very keen to encourage people to take the opportunities that are available now and to uh, apply across across the range. There are application deadlines in February, April and October uh, in, in 2018 and it would be fantastic to see as many institutions taking up those opportunities as possible. And just final point just to Marion, just to say that I was interested in your comments about the importance of learning foreign languages in this day and age. Mm -hmm. And your message, therefore, is that if we don't have a successor to Erasmus or continue our membership of Erasmus, and given the Scottish and UK track record of not being the best countries at learning foreign languages, that that would be a setback for learning foreign languages. Yes, definitely. And that's what, I mean, the, again, uh, based on research by British Council and also by British Academy, if you look at the languages, which are the 10 most important ones, they're not necessarily the languages which are taught in all institutions, I mean, apart from French, German, and Spanish, which is fairly well catered for. But also, if you then look at different factors like export, then suddenly German is in, in the uh, first level, or, or Mandarin. So we need to have a diversity of languages, and not just European language. It means, again, it's a definition, what we, do we consider, what are the most important languages? There are community languages, there are our heritage languages, British Sign Language, of course, is also part of it. But it's not just the languages which are uh, of uh, important or necessarily taught in the institutions. We need a diversity of languages. We can't just rely on just teaching one or two languages in school. We need to, to have the supply there. And we also need, and that was the point I was making, a, a strategic approach in Scotland, not just focusing on schools, but also in all sectors, the importance for business in colleges, in nursery, in adult education, lifelong learning, and I think only that way we can address the issues because it's all linked together. Thank you very much, convener. I mean, I think we all recognise the importance of the Erasmus Plus programme, and certainly everybody here is looking for a way to maintain it going forward. However, we can't ignore the fact that will be challenging, um, particularly around issues around uh, freedom of movement, where we can see the direction the um, current government is. is looking to take. There are other opportunities in that the programme is currently under discussion what it will look like post-2020. Um, and given the situation in Switzerland and the challenges there have been there as well, does anyone have any insight whether they see any significant changes, the possibility of that happening to the membership criteria there currently is that would maybe make um, a future relationship with the UK slightly easier? I don't, I'm afraid. Right, sorry. Does anyone think that there is any appetite? Is there any? I mean, we obviously, as a country, as we're going through the process of leaving, have particular issues with Erasmus. Do you see any other countries who are either trying to engage with the program or are currently engaged with the program who are looking for maybe similar flexibilities to be introduced? If that is likely to be, um, I don't know if anyone has an insight whether that's likely to be pursued flexibilities but certainly um, a big movement in other EU countries at the moment is increasing the Erasmus Plus budget by 10 um, and so that's while well, we're scrabbling on to try and keep it they're trying to raise it um, tenfold um, and so I think that really highlights the significance of the program for other EU countries that they see such value and benefit in it um, that they want to grow it even more um, we know that the the focus of the last or the seven years of this project has been diversity and inclusion and certainly we know that research has shown that young people with fewer opportunities rate the program more strongly than, than well-off young people. So we know that that, that focus has been um, a, a good one and successful. Uh, so it would be really interesting to see if they do increase the budget tenfold uh, of what that inclusion um, process and, and success rate would be like. I think it's clear, I think it's important that, that we're clear about this, that um, as things currently stand, um, if we're going to be out with the... EEA and uh, we're leaving freedom of movement behind, we cannot be a programme member. It's just not possible. 
you're nodding your head. Uh, and so the only alternative is uh, as a UK EU mobility program, such as the the, the Swiss have have um, have come up with, which you've all said is is, is not is not really what what you want. But even that doesn't seem to be on the table. You're not given any indication that you're hearing that that's been discussed or anything. No. So <laughs> we'll just have to hope that sessions like this um, influence those who are uh, taking the negotiations forward. Uh, I'd like to thank you all very much uh, for coming uh, to give evidence today. And uh, we'll now move into private session. I'm just going to suspend. Actually suspending.